one. Welcome to Major League Fantasy Football Weekly, Episode 5. My name is Corey Roberts. I am the owner of Major League Fantasy Sports, uh, MajorLeagueFantasySports.com. And I have with me today my co-host, my partner in crime, Mr. Lou Landers out there in L.A. Wanted to go ahead and introduce uh, Lou. He is going to be, I would say, the, more of the regular hosts on the show um, just in this week to kind of help out a little bit. We've also got Mr. Jeff Nelson on the show with us this week. Uh, he is a defensive coach out there at Whitehall High School in Pennsylvania. Um, he's here to talk some football with us today. He's also been with our organization for what, how long has it been now, Jeff? What, seven, seven, eight years? Almost eight years, I think. This year will be uh, eight for us because uh, I got, yeah. Yeah, I think it'll be it's eight years. So. Eight. Uh, Jeff's been around the block for quite a while. He's been, you know, he's been coaching for quite a while too. So he's he's a good guy to chat with about X's and O's. And we also have Mike Stromey on the line with us as well. He is our assistant editor over at MajorLeagueFantasySports.com. He is also a football writer. His articles publish every Sunday, and right now he is focusing on the running back right. rankings. So Mike, I just wanted to introduce you to the show. If you have a quick word or two you wanted to say, please go ahead. Of course, yeah, just like Corey was saying, I am the assistant editor at MajorLeagueFantasySports.com. My article, Stroll Me the Way, comes out every Monday morning now. Oh, it's Monday, that's it's right. It's Sunday, but it's morning. Yeah. It I, 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 just, I just run the site. I don't know what the hell goes on. You know, I just you know, <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what's going on. So anyway, uh, yeah. thanks, Mike. Uh, wanted to bring in our special guest, Mr. Matt Kelly, to the show. And I wanted to allow Matt to kind of, you know, chat with the audience and let them know what he does, who he is, where you can find him, and that type of thing. So, Matt, uh, welcome to the show, sir. Thanks, Corey. Yes, I'm a very special guest. Uh, my <laughs> website uh, that I, that I, yeah, that I have the uh, sort of curator for is called PlayerProfiler.com. Uh, it's an advanced metrics website. So essentially, if you want to see data that goes beyond the normal box score type data on a player from workout metrics to in-season efficiency type data on one screen you can go to our playerprofiler.com type in a player's name and pull them up it's also mobile optimized it was designed for those that if you're in a draft room and you just want to make a pick or if you're driving and you don't want to drive off the road you can just quickly <laughs> pull up a player make a decision and go hit a button and it's a lot easier to uh, see the see advanced metrics in one place without going to some of the more complicated, uh, more difficult to use uh, advanced metrics websites. We try to distill it down to one simple page so you can really understand intuitively. Hey, this player is good, or this player is not so good, and make it make it obvious uh, right on the screen without any other digging, filtering, so forth. So that's the site. That's why that's why it was created. And I think it's it's unique in that way. And we also have a show, or we have our own show called Roto Underworld Radio. And I host it to help people use the site and get the most out of it when I'm not getting distracted and, and, and going off on tangents telling random stories. So that's, it. that's me. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Also, uh, Corey, we should also introduce the show mascot. <laughs> <laughs> it's Mickey Jeets. Mickey Jeets has joined the yes. show with us. No, Matt, it, it, no, it's playerprofiler.com, and it's, and it's Roto. They, they can find that's your website, and then also on Twitter. What's your Twitter handle um, so people can find that? All right, yeah, follow me on Twitter at fantasy underscore mansion. I just passed the 5,500 Twitter followers threshold, which is an important threshold. Now I'm on to 6,000 followers, an equally important threshold. So let's all help <laughs> me get there. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. So playerprofiler.com, and they can find you know they know where to find you on Twitter. So that's awesome. So since you are uh, uh, you so aptly said the special guest, the very special guest, we will uh, actually get the conversation started with you. And I figure talking about overhyped players is something that uh, every single season in the, in, the, in the fantasy world, there's always certain players that people always get on board with, and it seems like it's almost a consensus. Almost a consensus, and what I tell people in that situation is run. I tell them to run. If it's a consensus with all the so-called experts, get, get your ass out of there. <laughs> so in the overhyped section, I know you listed a couple of players. Who would you like to start talking about first, Matt? 
So when you talk about, oh, these are the type, this is the archetype type of player that you want to stay away from, you're talking about the late riser during the summer, the guy that rises in the rankings, the Justin Hunter from 2014. Is that the archetype you're thinking about that you want to stay away from? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess, yeah, sure. Right. So I think another guy that's – he hasn't been rising throughout the summer because the summer's not over yet. But he's been rising so far. He's been rising in the early months of the summer is Justin Forsett. He started mm-hmm. off early in the year when the NFL 10s – and so my fantasy league has some best ball and, and draft master format mm-hmm. drafts that actually start in – February, and then they track the ADP starting in February. So I can go all the way back to February, and I can tell you that Justin Hunter, I'm sorry, excuse me, Justin Forsett was being drafted in the sixth round. Now he's being drafted in the second round, in the wow. middle of the second round, particularly in expert leagues. You're starting to see people drafting Justin Forsett because of the the Mark Trestman coach narrative that with Mark Trestman comes receptions. With Mark Tressman comes a chance at catching 75 footballs. And, oh, let's do the math. Let's extrapolate in our head. What if Justin Justin Forsett is the primary ball carrier in the Mark Tressman offense? What does that mean? Well, all of a sudden you can start thinking, wow, this guy, who he could go and rush for 1,300 yards and catch 75 footballs for another 500 yards, score 10 mm-hmm. touchdowns, and boom, that's – he's – one of the top running backs in football, and he's being now drafted like that, and it just doesn't make sense because he's a running back last year that they tried their best to not hand the starting job to. They said, oh, well, Ray Rice, okay, Ray Rice is out. Okay, well, how about Bernard Pierce? Oh, okay, never mind. Okay, well, how about Lorenzo Taliaferro? Oh, right. he's not quite ready yet. Okay, I guess we're going to give it to Justin Forsett, and then Justin Forsett was great, but he was great for a partial season. And if you go to playerprofiler.com and you look at our workout metrics, which is where you see things like 40 times and burst score and agility score, Justin Forsett is not a great athlete. He's not particularly fast. He's not particularly explosive. He's not particularly quick, even for a small running back, 198 pounds. The reason why Justin Forsett is 30 years old and has never started a season as a starting running back in the NFL is because He's small and slow. That will never change. It doesn't matter who his coach is. So now you have to start to think, wow, okay, so we're really going to draft a player in the second round purely because we like his offensive coordinator? That, to me, is a recipe for overdrafting a player. Yes, yes, it very well could be. And let, let's get Stromy in on the, on the conversation. The gentleman is focusing on running backs on our website. So, uh, Mike, uh, do, you, do you want to piggyback off of, of what Matt was saying, or do you want to add something else to that, uh, that uh, assertion? Um, what I'll say about Forsett is he, he's been in the league for several years, whether it was bouncing around between pro- practice rosters or losing his job to Marshawn Lynch like five years ago. Um, he's been around for a while, and he's only had real success last year. Mm-hmm. And that's that's kind of a scary proposition. If you're going to take him in the second round, I'd rather I'd much rather take a chance on uh, like somebody else. Really, Jeremy Hill. <laughs> yes, that's the name I was thinking of. <laughs> but uh, hello, <laughs> yeah. Jeremy Hill. He's being drafted ahead of Jeremy Hill, and that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense at all. Well, that's the ridiculous. second round of last year, Hill was one of played like a top back. Right, he was phenomenal. And I'd much rather take a chance on him than a guy who's had five bad years and half a good one. You know, let's let's get Lou in on this conversation too. Lou, Lou, what are your thoughts on on Justin Forsett? And it's obvious, obviously, it's been pointed out that he's definitely being overhyped. So, what what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I was gonna say I have no issues with Justin Forsett as a starting running back for the Ravens. I do have an issue of him being drafted that high. I wouldn't touch Forsett until the 8th or 10th round, personally. And likely he wouldn't be there by then because, like Matt and Mike have both mentioned, he's being drafted far too early. Um, I mean, like they're saying, last year was his first year where he even got a consistent starting role. That is, that's happened for a reason. I mean, you can say maybe once or twice it could have been extenuating circumstances, but 
since 2008 when he started in the NFL, he's never been a starter. You know, he was a starter by default, as Matt mentioned. And, yeah. you know, he might have he might, he might have some good games, but he's not worth even being taken in the first five rounds. Let, let well, alone Matt, I think Matt, Lou, I think Matt hit it too, though, yeah. on the, the fact that they kept trying to avoid giving him the gig last year. I think that does yeah. speak volumes. Uh, Jeff, yeah, uh, you, you exactly. have something you... You, uh, you want to pitch in on the Justin Forsett conversation? Yeah, I'm actually, I guess I, I'm in the minority here, and this is what's pretty amazing. I love the, the slipping on the coffee mug there, Lou. Uh, <laughs> I, I, think, I think it all starts up front, guys, with the front five. You know what I mean? That yep. offensive line in the NFL is rare to be uh, the same guys, and they were pretty good last year. And with Mark Tressman, it's not the offense is not going to change too much. I think it's still going to be a zone run team, um, and I think the holes is going to be there. I don't think. I mean, look, yeah, they lost Gary Kubiak, but I mean, still, I think Justin's production is going to be the same because there's not a major change on the offensive line. They re- returned their offensive line for the. I, think, I believe this is the third year in a row that they're going back to the same people they started with for the last two seasons. There's some continuity there, and that's rare in the NFL. And I think. With that zone block and scheme up there, I think Justin Set Forsett could be really good this year. I mean, I'm shocked that we're. I mean, look. I don't think. Okay, Jeff, going I don't think the the debate, rounds a lot. But Jeff, I don't think the debate really is, or the discussion is really about necessarily his success, how much success he'll have. I think the debate is more of where where he is being drafted in, in relation, you know, to his skill set. I, 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 yeah, I, I mean, I wouldn't argue anybody if they draft him in the second round. I mean, look, running backs, who, what other running back, what, who's his second challenger at running back this year? Like, if you realistically look issue. at it, yeah, there is no second challenger there. He is the primary back there. Like, and well, I don't think... Jeff, you. Yeah, Jeff. That's, I think that's the problem, is in a different situation, if he, if, if Justin Forsett was dropped, was parachuted into San Diego, <laughs> let's say they did a trade today, and they yeah. traded Melvin Gordon for Justin Forsett straight up. Or even in Dallas, Joseph Randall, Jacksonville, TJ Yeldon. There's certainly situations where the second and third running backs on the depth chart are not impressive. And you wouldn't be worried about Justin Forsett having a couple bad games and suddenly falling into a committee or losing his job. Yeah. However, in the fourth round, Ozzie Newsom drafted Buck Allen out of USC, and he loved Buck Allen. He took, he took Buck Allen. They had Buck Allen rated ahead of Jay Ayaji, and a lot of the guys the draft Knicks really liked this year, the Ravens had Buck Allen rated ahead of them because Buck Allen has the size. He's 220 pounds. He also was a great receiver, caught over 40 passes last year. So he's essentially – a better version of Justin Forsett in all the measurable ways that we have, that where we can look at college production, we can look at, and these are some things that we have on playerprofiler.com, college production is measured in a college dominator rating in one metric that we have. Then you look yeah. at the, the workout metrics. And so he's a guy that all else being equal, so, I, the uh, I mean, would prefer that, they, that he be their ball carrier. It's just that Justin Forsett is the incumbent and in the locker room, I, going to have to give him the football in week one, and then what happens after that, we'll see. Go ahead, Jeff. I think yeah, I see what you're saying, but then I look at the Atlanta Falcons situation last year when they drafted that rookie that was supposed to outwork Steven Jackson, and really he wasn't that impressive, kind of, you know? Like, this year he could have a big year, you know, be a second year in the NFL, but traditionally when rookies come in there, I mean, guys, I'm not going to say I'm the expert on running backs, but can you name a rookie that came in and exploded like the all wide receivers did last year? consistency, knowing that playbook. I think Justin Forsett, I, I wouldn't have a big issue with it going in the second round. If he's there at the second round for me, I'm grabbing him. Because I think... See, when, go ahead, Lou. Jeff, go ahead. what I was going to say, I've been waiting to say this since you mentioned Gary Kubiak. I actually think that Gary Kubiak had a big influence on Forsett's <laughs> success last year because he had him in Houston back in 2012. And they were very familiar with one another. Kubiak is gone. I think Forsett's actually going to struggle more without Kubiak and not be benefit as much from the Tressman as some people say. It'd be interesting to see. I mean, I think the the offense is going to be the same. Well, Jeff, Jeff, it's about scheme anyway, right? I mean, when you when you switch, yep, exactly. There's no doubt switch, about it. But I know Tressman's a different coach, but at the end of the day, is the running is the scheme of the running game any different? 
or is it, or you know, how how is that actually set up? And between the two, I, I think when when it comes in for example for us, when we got a new defensive coordinator, we didn't change our scheme. We made minor tweaks here and there, but you know, with the whole offensive line and everything being the same, even when we had a new head coach, we didn't make major adjustments. We just made minor tweaks. And I think with Mark Tressman and Gary Kudrow having the same philosophy when it comes to running an offense and building an offense, I think there are going to be minor tweaks there. I, I mean, and I will be interested to see at the end of the year what we're talking about. Oh, and by the way, uh, Matt, you, that was a great uh, segue uh, in, into Buck Allen. But before, and you did talk about him a little bit, so that's obviously you're putting four set on there. Buck Allen was a, was, a, was a perfect thing to discuss. You're, you're talking about a remedy or somebody that might actually – you know, takes a piece of the role or part of the role, or maybe at some point, maybe, maybe Forsett gets hurt and he takes the entire role. You know, I mean, you just never know. Before we move on, I wanted to make sure I mentioned our partners because obviously he wasn't thinking clearly before we started the show. Real Deal Dynasty Sports, uh, our partner, uh, Brian Lures, the owner of Real Deal Dynasty Sports, we wanted to thank him as well as Sports Palooza Radio Network, Lisa Gar and EJ, or excuse me, EJ Gar and Lisa Iannucci. Our baseball shows run every every Sunday night from 7 to 9 o'clock. Uh, Ron Chandler will be back on the show with us a week from uh, tomorrow. We have a great show tomorrow, and it's about the trading, all the crazy trades that have happened. Also, um, White River Graphics are in Indianapolis that provides us with the backdrops and provide me with the hats and, and all those types of things. Just wanted to make sure that I shout out our partners and people that we work with so I don't get, like, hate mail or something. So, anyway, uh, Matt, did you want to drill in a little bit further on uh, Buck Allen, and then I'll let the other guys kind of kick in real quick, or do you, do you want to move on? We can move on if you'd like. Well, here's my point on Buck Allen. Well, number, I don't want to I don't want to expand the scope of the argument too much, mm-hmm. but when I look at the – if I were just to take a step back and look at the, the backfield, look at the depth chart in Baltimore, mm-hmm. another guy I like is Lorenzo Taliaferro. Mm-hmm. Lorenzo Taliaferro was also – a fourth round pick last year. So it, the, the Ravens have been trying to use draft capital to, to enhance their backfield uh, and, and move away from Justin Forsett. They have been doing that. Um, remember, Justin Forsett w- was relegated by the Jaguars, and the Jaguars decided to go in the direction of Toby Gerhardt in, mm-hmm. instead of Justin Forsett. That happened. Um, so these front on, multiple front offices – have have a history of thinking to themselves, we need a guy that looks like a prototypical NFL workhorse. And that's what you saw with Cincinnati last year. We all, I think, we've seen Gio Bernard do some exciting stuff where he looks like someone is controlling him with a video game toggle. That's exciting. (laughs) But at the end of the day, Cincinnati coaches, they just want the guy that looks like he looks the part. They want the Jeremy Hill in their early down Role, And I think that that is always my assumption that that bias is at play in that, that that program is running in the back of the mind of the GM and the NFL head coach. And actually, that's what Lorenzo Taliaferro is. Lorenzo Taliaferro on playerprofiler.com has a, a well above average agility score. So if you look at weight adjusted agility, size adjusted agility, mm-hmm. Lorenzo Taliaferro has some Le'Veon Bell type traits. So mm-hmm. you could make the argument that in the passing game, that Buck Allen is the best receiver that they have in the backfield, and that in early downs, Lorenzo Taliaferro is the best player that they have maybe in that short role. Yardage. And maybe, then maybe short yardage. Where, yeah, then the question is, well, what's Justin Forsett the <clears> best at? And the answer would be nothing really. He's just the guy that was there last year. No, those are all good points to make and stuff that you should factor. You should factor that all of that stuff into your thinking when you go to draft a guy, especially if you're spending an early-round pick. And with you bringing up uh, uh, Jeremy Hill and then the Cincinnati backfield, we'll, we'll go ahead and transition there because I know Jeff wanted to talk about um, uh, Jeremy Hill. So, and, and you you have him in the overhype section, Jeff. Jeff, I'm not hearing you, buddy. You turn your mic back on. Oh, yeah, I'm here. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. uh, I know you wanted to talk about Jeremy Hill. So, you know, let's talk a yeah, little bit about now, look, why, why do you hold on? I, why I am, listed? Why is he listed overhyped to you? I, I think, you know, what was going on down there with that offensive coordinator, he is a power running. And I'm speaking strictly on a what I see as I envision the offense being turned out this year. Uh-huh. And I, I just see it as that Jeremy Hill 
Uh, a lot of defenses weren't prepared for him. Cincinnati, I think, you know, their offensive line is going to take a step back this year compared to what it was last year. Jeremy Hill is a very good, uh, you know, north-south runner. Uh, but I think they get more involved in the screen game and go back to Giovanni. Uh, uh, um, yeah, Giovanni. Giovanni his Bernard, name. Yeah. Uh, what's his, yeah, right. I'm Bernard, sorry. yeah. Yeah, and I think they go back to that balance attack because that's what the NFL as a whole – as the whole compass is changing into, it's more of a two back. You got the, you know, the thunder and lightning of the past. And I think like Jeremy Hill, he's on cut into his production time. You know, he's not going to be what he was valued at last year was a good pickup, but I think people are over picking him and grabbing him too early in the draft because they think he's going to be something that he's not going to be. He's not going to be an every down back player, so he shouldn't grab him. I agree with Jeff wholeheartedly. In fact, I actually traded Jeremy Hill straight up in a Major League Fantasy Sports League 2 for Matt Forte because I am convinced that Forte is going to have a lot more uh, playing time, see a lot more snaps, and I know the multi, um, he's, he's a multi-purpose, very versatile back. And I have to agree with Jeff on the fact that I just don't see Hill getting those every down snaps, especially with Gio Bernard there. I mean, Bernard got hurt last year, correct me if I'm wrong, and that's kind of what got Hill yeah. the yep. as he did get. Yeah, and I think that's what's leading to when we refer to this, and I can't wait to hear Matt's opinion, because I'm actually playing with his website right now. It's pretty cool. Let's get, let's get Mike involved. Shout out to let's, first time. Let's, let's get Mike involved in the conversation real quick. So, Mike, what, what, what is your uh, assessment of the Cincinnati backfield in regards to Hill? Well, I'm gonna right. be a little. Oh, I'm gonna be. Yeah, I'm gonna be a little bit of a contrarian here. I am a Hill believer, just to the simple fact that, um, you know, name me another running back who had a better second half than Jeremy Hill. Like he, when he did get the opportunity, he sees Jay it. Anderson. And uh, yeah. Wait, well, he that's your right. Mike. He yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. That was a great <laughs> I had to say it. I had to say it. Go ahead, go ahead, Mike. I was trying to think. Yeah, but yeah, like he had a monster. Yeah, he had a monster second half, and sure, Bernard's gonna get some snaps too. But I do think that Marvin Lewis and that coaching staff wants that, you know, big back that will carry the load for most of it. Like I, I can see him getting maybe two thirds of the snaps there, and. Uh, using uh, Bernard as like a change of pace back, but I, I am a, I am a Jeremy Hill believer. Uh, Matt, would you like to uh, kick in? Mike, are you are you are you Canadian? Yes, you have two Canadians on here right now. Yes, I knew it. I knew that accent. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Maine, so I, we have a lot of Canadians. So I'm I'm versed in in in, yeah. in that Lou, way. Hey, Lou, so Lou and Lou, both Lou and Mike. Canadian. Uh, flavor. Matt, Lou, both Lou and Mike are pretty Lou's much from the same area in Canada. Canada. Both of them, Lou oh, and Mike. That's Southern Ontario. Yep. Terrific. But I, I reside, I reside in Los Brunswick. Angeles. Yeah. I reside in Los Angeles, so I'm not really that Canadian anymore. <laughs> we could tell with the jacket. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, Matt, uh, you know, no do, do you want to kick, wear that jacket? Do you want to kick it on the jacket? <laughs> <Hill>, uh, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> No, actually, no. I take that back. At the Canadian, at the Toronto Film Festival, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, well, no, it'd be denim. So, here are two things on this. Once, okay, so on the ADP charts, the ADP list on myfantasyleague.com, the running backs go Forte at 14, Demarco Murray at 15, okay, Lashawn McCoy at 17, and then Jeremy Hill at 18. And I give you that context because I think that's the cutoff from LaShawn McCoy to Jeremy Hill, I believe, is a cutoff because that is actually the, the cutoff where the every down bell cows that you can rely on as an RB1 in fantasy, that's where they stop. And then Jeremy Hill is the beginning of a whole new tier, the best of the guys that are in shared backfield situations, or are, we haven't seen them do it before, Todd Gurley, Melvin Gordon types. Mm -hmm. So I rarely will draft the player at the beginning of the next tier. So once the running backs, once it's sort of a bellwether situation, 
Once DeMarco, Forte, and McCoy are gone, I'm immediately in, in a standard sort of redraft format, snake draft format, I'm starting to look at receivers exclusively at that point. And then I can get a, a guy that's in a timeshare much later, maybe a Tevin Coleman with upside, someone like that, many, Joseph Randall. I can get some of those guys later, and I don't have to use second-round draft capital on Jeremy Hill and miss out on Jordy Nelson, miss out on Mike Evans, because that's the opportunity cost of taking a Jeremy Hill. And if he's not an entrenched bell cow role because of the presence of Gio Bernard, I don't really have interest in Jeremy Hill in the second round. So I'll say that, first of all. Okay. Second of all, I, I like to do touch math with my with my teams and put things in context as well. So if we start thinking about where some of these players are projected to go and the fantasy points for the season and the fantasy points per game that they're projected to score this year, mm-hmm. you start to add it up. And I want to tell you something interesting. Start to think about the fantasy points that need to be scored to support Jeremy Hill's ADP, Gio Bernard's ADP, A.J. Green's ADP. Now who's rising? Marvin Jones. Now who's rising? Tyler Eifert. You start to do the math. That would require, to support all of the the, the costs of all these Bengals players, Mm -hmm. it would require Andy Dalton to be a QB1 in fantasy. So the offense for the Bengals is, like, not working. It's like I'd have to (laughs) stretch that to the outer bounds of plausibility (laughs) to believe that these Bengals are all worth where they're going. I, I mean, I, I agree with that, man. I mean, I don't so chase far. personally. Personally, I don't. I don't chase running backs at all. I hardly, you know, I, I look for value. I'm looking for value. Getting getting handcuffs, handcuff guys, or maybe a guy nobody's paying attention to that I could draft a few rounds later. I mean, I, I I really try not to get into that into that pissing contest and and trying to get all the top end running backs because at the end of the day they're too expensive. And they're too damn fragile, too, by the way. They're too freaking fragile. And I just saw I Matt that. just turn into, like, the Incredible Hawk just now. It felt like he was just at the Tesla. When he was trying to contort his body, it looked like he was about to turn into the Hawk or something. Let's, let, let, let's yeah, move I mean, along. Andy Dalton is the top five quarterback. Okay. Yeah, let's move, let's move it That's along, guys. You need a superhero to, 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 to switch bodies with Andy Dalton to support the costs of all these Bengals offensive players. I just, I don't, I, this math's not working for me with all with this stuff. That's just, the, yeah, and that's, and that's again, that's just, you know, your opportunity, your, your basics of football is just, you know, looking at that type of situation and making an assessment. Um, let's let's go to Stroman. Let's go to, to Mr. Running Back himself. Uh, let's talk about another, some underhype, some of your underhype guys. Um, Ch- uh, Charles Sims or uh, Garrett Blount, which one do you want to start with? Um, uh, let's go with Blunt. And I think there's obviously a lot of negativity surrounding him, obviously, with the, the one-game suspension. And it's one game, but people are going to say, oh, he's, he's suspended, and then they're going to get that, you know, mm-hmm. recency bias of, oh, I'm not going to have him for a game. But the truth of the matter is he's, he's, he's going to play 15. And uh, Bill Belichick, like, on, offensively and defensively, he's kind of a chameleon. Instead of playing to his team's well, strengths, video there, Mike. We'll look at the weakness of the opposition. I'm sorry? There we go. Your video feed came back. Sorry about okay. that. Continue. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, yeah, as I was saying, like, from a play calling standpoint, Belich- Belichick's kind of a chameleon. Like, instead of taking um, his strengths and just kind of pushing it on the opponent, he'll look for weaknesses in in his opposition and – there, there'll be some times where he'll be, he'll go up against a, uh, like a run, <clears throat> a team that'll struggle against the power run, and he'll run the gear blind into the into the ground. So there'll be some games where he'll just go off, and the rest of them he'll be like 10, 40, and maybe he scores, which has value as well. Which is so what what, what you're talking about here is, is somebody, here. but Mike, you, so so what you're talking about here is, is somebody that you could draft to maybe round out your your core of running backs. And if, you know if you're if I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying in certain matchups you assess what you were telling people is that he he's going to get fed the rock against teams who can't stop the power run, and those should be games that you should play him. Is that basically what what I'm hearing? Yeah. Okay. Essentially, yes. Okay, Lou. And Lou, there, what do you yeah, thought? There'll be other games where he'll have like a 10, 40, and a touchdown. 
Okay. Lou, what are your thoughts? Well, I'm sorry. An interesting um, point. I do like blunts, so I'm going to uh, <laughs> know that. say that I do I do like LeGarrette Blunt, um, but I do have to agree that anytime you're starting a guy like LeGarrette Blunt, you are it's really like a, it's it's a complete hit. He's going to have games where he's puts up like 20, 25 points and just hammers the rock pounds and pounds and pounds. And other times where he gets like two, three carries, does not have much success, and they go to somebody else. So, um, I don't know. I mean, it, sorry, is he on your underhyped list or your overhyped list, Mike? Under. Under, under yeah. I'm going to have to disagree. I don't think he's underhyped. I think he's perfectly hyped. Um, he is exactly what he is. He's going to have good games he's, and he's going to have bad games. Hyped? <laughs> yes. How about you, yes. Jeff? So Mike makes a good point, though. Mike's point oh, is interesting ahead. because if you own hey. both, whoever the passing down back is, and you own the running, the, the, the between the tackles grinder for the Patriots, the interesting thing about that is that you can look at the matchups and play the matchups. Last year, if you just looked at the opposing defense's rush yards per game allowed, mm-hmm. if you just looked at that, you would have played the right run, Patriots running back in most situations. You would have played Jonas Gray against the Colts. You would have played Shane Vereen. For example, Shane Vereen against great defenses, that's when you want to play Shane Vereen. That's when he, does, he did great work against Seattle and other teams whenever there was a stout run D. They didn't play that many stout run Ds last year. So that's why you saw Blunt and Gray go off in certain weeks. But it's interesting that he's almost a predictable chameleon in that way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Jeff, what are your thoughts? And I, I'm a penny back of a mat, like being a, and uh, also Mike here, and also say like I under hype. Uh, you know, it's hard to say. Um, I guess I hit the loose synonym there of being evenly hyped uh, because. I, it's just hard. You're going to have to draft him in a situation where you do have your good backs, and you're going to have to see what who the Patriots are playing and if he's a good plug-and-play or not. Um, I think that's where that situation is with Blunt because, he, you know, there's a great analysis there by Mike, which it, it makes total sense when you say he doesn't care to his team strengths. He's going to play to his opponent's weaknesses. So if they're weak against a downhill running back, LeBron is going to get fed the ball till he pukes. But if they're <laughs> a team that's weak against the sweeps and the screens, then you're going to have another running back in there, and Blunt might touch the ball two times, you know? So I think, like, that's going to really be a, a matchup play. So I don't I don't know exactly where his ADP is right now, if somebody wants to shoot it out there. But, like, I see him being, like, a late-round pick, like maybe 10th, 11th, 12th round pick. Maybe a third, fourth running back off the board. He's going yeah. in the sixth round. In the sense of being now. undervalued, yeah. In the sense of uh, Blunt being undervalued, I th- I just think people are going to take somebody who maybe has track speed or somebody who's, you know, kind of a sexier name than Blunt. I don't really think he's going to, you know, like you know what I'm trying to say there. Well, I, mean, I think his name is very sexy. I respect the most have Blunt higher <laughs> than most. Yeah, the, look, yeah. The, the, so are you saying Blunt right now is being drafted in the sixth round, though? Yeah, the, the, that's the absurd seven. to me. That's absurd wow. to me. I think I, that I I think that actually makes him overhyped. But that's that's just my opinion, and I'm entitled to it. <laughs> like you're entitled to wear that blazer there that we all can't stand right now, but it was okay. <laughs> you're entitled in California. You Californians are different. <laughs> It's, it's, it's pick on Lou Day. Pick on Lou Day today. All right, let's. let's it's all right, man. I've had a, I've had a week. I've had the week from hell, so I can take it at this point. Well, Lou, we we haven't. I haven't gone to. Yeah, yet. I know you can take it. I'm well aware of you taking it, buddy. I haven't gone to you yet, Lou, to get us started in conversation. So I want you to pick out a player, either overhyped, underhyped, or rookies that you you have listed here, and and get us started discussing. Well, perhaps you can help me and tell me who I listed because I do not have it in front of me at the moment. <laughs> no problem, brother. Uh, underhyped. Underhyped. This is a You're going to get a speech this afternoon from Corey Roberts. Expect a phone call. 
Under <laughs> <laughs> under hype, Darren McFadden. Uh, okay, yeah, let's talk about. Actually, you know what? I don't want to talk about him. He was just put on the pup list. So next. How about Zach Stacy? Uh, okay, perfect. Um, I like Zach Stacy a lot. I liked him last year with St. Louis as well. Um, I think he was. I mean, I don't. I don't blame the Rams for um, you know taking Gurley and um, you know therefore moving Stacy. But I think Stacy kind of got the uh, the poor end of the, uh, the stick there, mm-hmm. uh, so to speak, because he's a great running back, and I think he's going to do very well with the Jets. I think they have a really good one-two punch there um, with him and uh, Stephen Ridley. I think is there as well. I think so. But both both are significant, yeah, and Ivory. Both, all three of which are upgrades to Chris Johnson, um, in my opinion. I'm sure you'll probably all agree. And I think Stacy, I think Stacy's actually going to be overlooked because of the fact that um, he is in a, a backfield with a number of other guys who touch the ball. But in my opinion, he's um, he's the guy that they should be going to and should get the rock the most. Um, I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not there to see what's going on and to hear what's going on in in their their meetings and everything, but I think think they made that trade for Stacey because they want him to be their number one back. And he definitely has the credentials to be a number one back. Let's let's go to, let's go to Matt. Uh, Do you think, do you think people are forgetting about Stacey in New York uh, with the other people in the backfield or is that kind of a fallacy? Right now, for the depth charts I'm seeing, it's Chris Ivory is the grinder on first and second down with Bilal Powell as their third down back. That's what we've heard. That's what the public information coming from the Jets, the people that cover the Jets. Will Zach Stacy make the team? I think he will. It really depends on Stephen Ridley's health. Mm-hmm. You have to remember, not only did the Rams draft Todd Gurley, but they also drafted Trey Mason. Yep. In, in the wake of having, after already having Zach Stacy on the roster and knowing what they had in Zach Stacy, they invested significant draft capital, second round draft capital on Trey Mason, and then top ten pick draft capital on Todd Gurley. I just don't, I don't know where the the Zach Stacy um, enthusiasm comes from. But I remember the one year, a couple of years ago, he certainly he was the best of a truly awful running back core that they had there. But I don't think that he's a number one running back in the league. I think that when you watch him play, his metrics indicate that he is relatively fast for his size and very agile for his size. But when you watch him play, he doesn't seem to be the type of guy that's making people miss. He doesn't look like Le'Veon Bell. Le'Veon Bell is a big guy who's sneaky agile for right. a 230-pound player. Zach Stacy has similar measurables. He's big and sneaky agile, but he looks nothing like Le'Veon Bell on the football field. He looks more like a, a straight-line plotter. I think if uh, the football fan – where it would say who would compare more, most closely to Zach Stacy, Sean Green or Le'Veon Bell, they would select Sean Green, unfortunately. And this is coming from a place where, again, I liked Zach Stacy when he came out of Vanderbilt. I had him to be the guy to ascend to the top of that depth chart. But the moment they drafted Trey Mason, I knew it was his we time was, was on the wall. And now that, that he's on. The writing was on the wall at that point. Once right. They, well, they brought in yeah, Mason. but yeah. maybe he holds him off. You want to give? I wanted to give him a chance to hold him off, but then the way things played out last year, he he really almost didn't put up a fight on the depth chart. It was strange to me because of the he wasn't the player that I saw the year before. Maybe he was hurt last year. Maybe he was playing through an injury, and that's why he didn't look the same. But either way, I. Even if it's even if we're talking about best case scenario, Zach Stacy, I don't see him usurping Chris Ivory on the depth chart because Chris Ivory is one of the underrated smash mouth grinder first and second down bulldozer running backs in the NFL. I mean, he breaks more tackles according to Pro Football Focus on a per touch basis. Very few running backs, if any, break as many tackles as Chris Ivory has over the last few years. 
Like, and I, I, I got just to throw one thing out there, Matt. Like, and this is what I think when we're all compiling this list today, we kind of overlook Chris Ivory. Like, we can all say and say he's kind of awesome. Overlooked. Yeah, <laughs> we overlooked him, and we and like we got all these other guys that are under hype here. But how about the biggest, uh, uh, possibly one of the biggest under hypes is going Chris Ivory, and where is he getting drafted at? Like, is he get? I, yeah, for sure. His ADP is going to blow your mind. I just got Chris Ivory in a dynasty league in round 12 that wow. has a, wow. a carry premium, meaning you get wow. 0.25 points per carry. Wow. And everyone's wow. rushing, rushing, like, like a flood of people flooding out of a building that's on fire <laughs> to get running backs. And then I'm like, in the 12th round, I'm like, oh, I guess I'll just take Chris Ivory. Uh, yeah, he's garbage. Let's really understand why yeah, he's like, garbage. Right, whatever. Yeah, like you know. Yeah, guys, I think right. we'd all take. I think we'd all take him in the twelfth round. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, oh, for Zach, sure. But my my biggest reason for bringing up Zach Stacy is that he couldn't even go undrafted or go very very late. And based on the upside that he does have. In my opinion, that's what under hype is where you can get it. That's what's great about being in America. Everyone can have an opinion, right? That's the great part about being in America, right? Canada, too. But (laughs) in Canada, too? Yeah. (laughs) But the problem is, like, guys, like, Zach Stacy (laughs) is somebody I'm not touching. I mean, I'm staying away from Zach Stacy just on the grounds of, like, you got Powell, you got Chris Ivory, and then you don't know what's going to happen with Ridley. Do we all say Ridley? Show promise at times with uh, the Patriots, and what that guy a little bit, what that guy had fumble the troubles, yeah. even though he's on the pub, all yeah. right. But like, listen, I I just think Zach Stacy got shafted. Let's be honest, he was in an unfortunate situation in St. Louis. He's not. I doubt. I'd be interested to see if he makes the team, but he will get picked up. Somebody that can use him is probably like somebody like Dallas. It's probably somebody like Oakland. It's yeah. probably somebody. A lot, even in San Diego can use a running back back in there to back up. So there's other teams out there that can really use Zach Stacy services, and I'm just shocked that everybody didn't run for Zach Stacy and the Jets picked him up. But that's along with what the Jets do. You know, the Jets just do weird things at times. Well, well, like, to, they're just to, a weird to make a point. To make a, to make a point. At this point, we're we're all we're all kind of speculating as to what his role may or may not be. Because, we, you know, we obviously haven't seen, you know, preseason games and see how they're going to use him in the offense and what he actually looks like. So it's, it's – at this point, bringing up him in discussion and talking about the fact that he's on the Jets, but then they have all this other talent is a great – is a good conversation. And most people that are going to be watching or listening to the show, you know, maybe they maybe they didn't realize Bilal Powell was still there. Maybe they didn't realize, uh, you know, Chris Ivory was still there. All they heard about was Ridley and, and, uh, and Zach Stacy. But, no, they definitely have some decisions to make. That's for sure. They have some major decisions to make in this in that backfield. So it'd be interesting to see how it plays out. Interesting to see who ends up with the job. I would kind of lean to more towards the Chris Ivory um, uh, side of things, the way you guys have discussed it. And then, but I, I'm not just going to throw Zach Stacy out, out the out the window and say, "Well, Powell is just going to uh, be the number two guy." I I I think Zach Stacy is going to be the number two guy. And if something happens to Chris Ivory. And you know he goes down or whatever. Zach Stacy can step right in and, and handle that role. So I think you keep him on your radar, and you know obviously as the so they're going to carry four backs. I mean three backs into the uh, season. No, I, I mean, didn't say that. Four backs I, I, I didn't. Like... I didn't say that. I'm talking about who's going to end up at one and two. That's what I was saying. Who's going to end up at one and two? I think Chris Ivory and, and Zach Stacy make it make a the nice pair. The only issue with Stacy is he doesn't play on special teams. Yeah, yeah Stacy's a little harder to carry on the roster because he doesn't play yeah. on special teams, so that's where he, some other guys have advantages. That's how a guy like Bilal Powell sticks around. That's a good point. However, here's what I want to say about these late-round running backs. I found myself being weirded out drafting Chris Ivory. I had to draft him just be based on the talent profile and his role as a starter. had to draft him. But I rarely find myself taking any – running back on a bottom five offense, T.J. Yeldon, whoever the guy is on the Browns, Isaiah Crowell at the moment. These are guys I almost never find myself drafting because their ceiling is so low, their volume, 
the, the red zone opportunities, the reception opportunities are so much lower than a player like Eddie Lacy or whoever the next Eddie Lacy is going to be. I'd much rather, for example, take a shot on a guy like Dan Heron, who could be a pass to a high volume passing down back on one of the best offenses in football, than I would taking shots on Duke Johnson and, and guys like that on the on the bottom of the barrel offenses. That's, that's generally how I approach late round running back play. But this Chris Ivory was such an outlier, and it was just his ADP was so weird that I just found myself drafting him on principle. Well, I mean, it's low hanging fruit. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that yeah. principle is going to pay gotta, you off, though. I got to say something quickly. Um, I've been looking at statistics while you guys have been talking, and I like Chris Ivory as much as you guys do, but Chris Ivory's best season in the NFL isn't even as good as Zach Stacy's rookie season in the NFL. Just keep that in mind. That's keep true. that in mind. And also remember, the Rams suck. The Rams offensively <laughs> are terrible, and they have been. Tell us how you really feel. I'm sorry, Stromae, but it's true. In long years, bud. <laughs> Okay. Long, so, let, let, let's get let's get yeah. Mike in. Yeah, so, so y'all Canadians stick together. Hold on, guys. Let's get yeah. Mike in on the conversation. You, Lou. This is going to work out because, like Jeff said, yeah. they're going to cut Zach Stacy. Dallas is going to pick him up. Joseph Randall's going to get busted for shoplifting again. Zach Stacy's going to be the starter. <laughs> you're gonna get to be right. Don't worry, man. Yeah. You're going to be right. Yeah. I'm you're good, man. man. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm about to go get one myself right now. Hold on. Look, look. I want, I want to hear something from Mike here, man. We we haven't uh, we, we've skipped over Mike. I want Mike to, to okay. pitch in on this conversation. Honestly, Mike, it, it bogs my mind how long we sp- speaking about uh, Zach Stacy, but yeah, he, he had a great rookie year. But um, like I watched obviously I watched a lot of Rams games, and there were times where he would just look like he was running into a brick wall. Like he just. Didn't have it. I don't know if he just wasn't picking up routes or whatever or not reading the defenses, but he looked awful. And by the end of the year, he was the third guy on that offense in that depth chart. He was losing carries, obviously, Trey Mason and Benny Cunningham. Like, he just he, he fell out of favor. And there was a reason why they get, the Jets gave up a seventh-round pick. And that's all, you know, they would take for him. And honestly, I just, I'm not a believer. I didn't rank him in my rankings. I'm not going to touch him unless maybe he moves to a situation like San Diego, obviously would be great. They have a great offensive line and, um, you know, say Melvin Gordon were to get hurt, he would, he might be okay there, but uh, being the possible third guy in an offense that probably isn't going to put up a lot of points. uh, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not buying it. All right. So we spent, we spent enough time on that conversation for sure. It was definitely interesting. uh, uh, One at that. Well, dude came on the show, Corey, with a Rams jersey. We had to give him some love. Here. They don't talk about him other than this. Like, this is the opportunity. Right? Ain't well, nothing to cheer about. It's like the Zach right. Stacy insider, and we waited till the end to go to him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what are we doing here? You know, what the hell's the host doing? I'm just sitting here listening. So, Jeff, uh, you have another guy on your list that's overhyped. Overhyped. C.J. Anderson. Tell us why he's overhyped. Yes. Let's talk about – I it blows my mind, again, <laughs> from one production of a half a season, and he gets drafted so hot. People, let me tell you, Gary Kubiak, guess what he is? A zone-running offensive guy, right? Zone blocking, fill the holes, guy between the guards and tackles. He's going to run the ball. Guess who fits that power scheme? Monty – Ball, people. I'm telling you, Monty Ball is going to have a big – Matt, I see your face, Matt. This is video live. So I see the <laughs> facial expressions, but let me tell you, Monty Ball, what did You're they do at up. Wisconsin? You're literally breaking up. You are literally oh. breaking up now. I said, what did they do at you Wisconsin? Broke up. <laughs> what did they do at Wisconsin? Wisconsin runs the mic down, zone right? running scheme. So – I'm telling you right now that expect Monty Ball to outwork CJ. CJ might get the job out of camp, but it's going to change, and Monty Ball is going to be that player that we all thought he was going to be 
two to three years ago. He's been hurt in the last two years with injuries, and I get that. And everybody's hesitating on him, but he will be on my team as my third or fourth before, running back this year. We, everybody's before, overlooking before, him. Before, okay, Jeff, before we go to anybody else, Matt, if if you would like, I will send you a, a, uh, a link so you can listen to our radio show last summer. That we did on running backs, and you'll see how oh, how much Jeff is in love with ball. Oh shit! Here we go. You, you'll see how much he's in love with this guy. And he well, we know how much Jeff loves balls. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> last year, last year uh, there were several the guys that I was just screaming at people to not touch, and Monty Ball was one of them. I said, "Don't touch Monty Ball." Period. End of story. Run. It was him and then everybody that was that was frothing at the mouth over Jacquoy Bell last year. Oh, my God. Everybody was falling all over themselves. And they didn't get anything from that guy until, what, week seven or week eight after Bush started getting banged up? Corey, Corey, Corey. Corey. Oh, okay. Look, Here's I your attaboy. Move listen, on. Listen, like, you listen. did one thing right in your life. <laughs> Joe, listen. <laughs> listen, I agree with you when you say he's a better – his talent, his skill set is a better fit for that scheme. So I, I do agree with that. I just, I just think he stinks. I mean, re- really, that that simple. So anyway, I, I, I had to throw that out there because you, you've been all over that ball crap for like two years now. So uh, Matt, Matt, what do you have to say about this uh, discussion about uh, Jeff's uh, love child? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what, what do you got? Story. Let me uh, just. <laughs> yep. Uh, <laughs> let me let me reaffirm something for you. People love Told You So Radio, just so you know. So keep coming with those. I told you so last year. That that's great sports radio right there. That's that's the formula right there. I told you so. I told you so. I told you so. Opinion. I told you so. I told you so. I told you so. Opinion. So you're on record now, being right. Congratulations. Appreciate that. I don't like. I, I think. I think there was a. I think. I, I think I misheard the start of the segment. So I think I thought it was overhyped instead of underhyped, or I thought it was underhyped instead of overhyped. And then the C.J. Anderson, and I got confused. I, I'm not a C.J. Anderson fanatic either. So I. It was a. Excuse me. It was a miscommunication of body language. Uh, on, on my part. <laughs> Here's what I'll tell you to back up what Jeffrey's saying. Now this isn't. Monte Ball. I think we don't know what's going to happen. It, it, Juwan Thompson could lead the Broncos in rushing this year. We don't know, but that's the point. That's why you. I'm not drafting C.J. Anderson in the first round. I saw some some well-respected fantasy analysts putting C.J. Anderson number one in their rankings because and the the stat that they wave around is in the last eight games of the season last year cj anderson had this and cj anderson did that and then if you extrapolate it to a 16 game season oh my goodness this guy's gonna go for 2,000 yards (laughs) oh the beauty of extrapolation this is the same guy that's drafting mark davis bryant in the second round you see what I'm saying? You guys up yes, I, I, no, I, I get you laid down. And Corey loves these speculations, too, just so everybody knows. <laughs> the, um, it's yeah. interesting. It's interesting, <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> Matt, Matt, that's an interesting point. Um, also, I mean, it's it's Peyton Manning that's run, running that offense. You know what I mean? Like, it's it's almost like – you could throw – if you put any running back there, like C.J. Anderson kind of stepped in there, a they're going to get their chances. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's like – yeah, at the end of the day, it's like pay, the, the offense goes through Peyton Manning's right arm and right shoulder, right? So as long as Peyton Manning is throwing passes and using the deep ball and hitting Demarius Thomas, they're going to be able to run the ball effectively. Whoever it is is going to be good. I don't think there's one person that stands out there, and I would be staying away from all of them right now until this, there's something more clear. But right now, if I had to pick, I'd also go with Ball. I agree with Jeffrey as well. I would go with Ball over C.J. Anderson. Let's, let's get, let's sure. It's a family right. show, so I'll leave it at that. Let me finalize <laughs> the argument against, against C.J. Anderson. Okay, go ahead. So the, the Broncos had an interesting schedule last year where they faced a number of cupcake defenses – but then they also face the NFC West. Okay? Now, go look at their schedule. 
when they faced Seattle, when they faced Arizona, when they faced San Francisco, guess who was the running back? Not C.J. Anderson. Those were the early season games. Those were the teams that Monte Ball and Ronnie Hillman had to face. Then those guys are gone. C.J. Anderson right, comes in. Oh, thanks, guys. I'll take the game against Oakland, and then I'll take another game against Oakland. <laughs> Most of C.J. Anderson's production came against Oakland. I, I, I know not the majority <laughs> of it, but if you look at it on a per-game basis, no. how C.J. Anderson abused the Oakland Raiders – that inflated his stats, and then if you actually do play out a full season for C.J. Anderson and include teams like Seattle and like San Francisco and like Arizona that have great run defenses, like St. Louis, he's not that. He's not a. There it is. He's not a top ten running back when you do that. Yeah. No, I don't even know if he's a top twenty running back when you do that. Let's and I love the fact that yeah, Matt you just like, mentioned. Like, the, the stats that he got and, like, what he did against a weaker schedule. And that's what these analysts and these guys that don't pay 10 minutes into doing research saying, yes, let's grab CJ. Come play in the league so I can just take your money every day. Because you're grabbing guys like that off these type of analysts that don't, you know, take care of eight, eight weeks. That's why they play 16 games, people. There's 16 games in a season. Like, don't take all. Oh, well, highlight, like, can we clip that? Because that was insightful. They play 16 games. Jeff, that should be in the highlights. That should <laughs> Thank be, you. You should open the show with that. <laughs> <laughs> they play a 16 game schedule. You heard it here on Major League Fantasy Football. <laughs> is, it, is it eight at home and on the road? or? <laughs> well, Mike, Mike, go, Mike, go ahead and also, jump in on the conversation. One more, one more quick thing, ball is. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, it was his job. Like, I can see the. I see. I can see how people would be scared off of him last year, and how you shouldn't drop him last year. But you forget that he had an apendectomy, like at the end of um, training camp. And I've never had one, but I hear it drains a lot of your strength. And that's like going into the season, you can't really, if you're not strong, it's going to hamper your season. So maybe he he just lost the job there, and then he got like obviously he got hurt like midway through the season, and then just kind of lost the job. I read an article in the Denver Post, I believe it was. Um, with Monte Ball, and he he seemed pretty pissed off that they just kind of handed C.J. Anderson this job. So he's gonna be he's gonna be pretty motivated coming into training camp, and I want to see uh, how he responds. No, definitely. No, hey, yeah, well, that, 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 that's that's a good point. That's a good point. And I know baseball and football are totally different sports, um, but. And I've been to me either, but there's MLB players that will have an appendectomy and be back in the starting lineup two days later and play all season long. So I don't think that that's really a very good excuse, maybe for one week. But I don't, I don't buy that. You're a professional athlete. If, if you're healthy enough to be on the field. I think baseball players had an appendectomy and were back a couple days later? Yes. That's a, I, don't, I don't see that. <laughs> they were. It it, 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 it's happened over the last couple of years. Everybody's calling you a no. piece meter on air. No, it's, it's happened over the last <laughs> couple, couple, couple of years, man. Uh, I'll go look for it while, while you guys keep, keep talking. Okay. Let's let's uh let's All move right, so the conversation. Who's done for the show? Wow. Is the, the rest of us? I mean, I knew that we were making strides, you know, medical technology, but that would be <laughs> my mind. Boom. Yeah. Let's move the conversation along. Uh, you know, Jeff, you had another guy, a uh, couple of guys that are under hype uh, that I think would be interesting discussion, especially uh, uh, C.J. Spiller. Uh, from from New Orleans. Yeah. So you have him listed as under hype though. Why 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 do you have him listed as under hype? I, I don't. When I was putting this list together, I was thinking about like guys that you don't really hear a lot about. And when you, you know when you think about guys that you don't hear about a lot about, and you're wondering. Last year, the one I dropped, everybody talked about C.J. and San Frank. You know, uh, Fred Jackson. But you're not hearing a lot about C.J. Spiller. And C.J. Spiller is a guy that I think fits what the Saints love to do. Get a running back, and they're running back in space, you know, which they lost with Darren Sproles, 
and let them just make a couple tackles, people miss tackles, and get to the end zone, right? You know, and they lost their big tight end. So who's going to fill that void? You know what I mean? Uh, wide receivers, everybody can talk about, you know, Cook being that guy to fill that role. But I think it's more going to be C.J. Anderson, and I think it's going to be Mark Ingram. Ah, yes, he, he's still there, and he's a north-south runner. But I think C.J. Anderson gives them what Spiller. the Saints do. Spiller, keep saying, and spread the ball Jeff, out. And, Jeff, Jeff, you keep oh, saying C.J. Anderson. I'm sorry. I see. All right. So I mean CJ Spiller, and then he's going to spread the, spread the ball out, and they they go, they're going to make things happen. And he just seems like his name is not getting any traction. I think he's the model of what they do, and I see them going like I see him having a big year. Lou, go ahead. Got go ahead, thirty-four Luke. ADP right now, which is late third round. Hold on, not ahead, holiday Luke. of the St. Louis Cardinals. Matt Holiday, the St. Louis Cardinals, had an appendectomy. Seven days later, was back in the lineup for the St. Louis Cardinals, playing left field and hitting third in their lineup. There's a difference from seven days to two days, I think, though. <laughs> I, said it, I, said, okay, I said a few days. First, I said a few days. Secondly, I said... Secondly, I said two is not I seven. Ball, no. ball. Can I have okay, a few but, bucks from you? <laughs> okay. I also said, I also said, I'll give Monte Ball a week. Jeez, that's an excuse, but not an entire season. No, no, no. You're, you're, also, you're we'll play back. I didn't Lou. say seven games. I yeah, didn't say Lou, seven games. Lou. I said seven days. Lou, Lou, your, your point was made. That he, that he came back relatively quickly. I think that was the point you were trying to make. How many days yes. it was, who cares? Exactly. <laughs> He came back in seven days. But I see Matt yeah. squirming around down there, so, I, so I'm going to go to Matt right here. <laughs> go ahead, Matt. No, I, no, I, think, it's, I think it's a push. I think it's a push, I think it's a push because, I, because I have to admit, I'm impressed that any athlete came back after only seven days from an appendectomy. I mean, I mean, can't the, hear anything. The incision oh, hey, point Matt, is no Matt, the field yet. Matt, so that's impressive. I have to say. Matt, I'm impressed. Matt, hold on a second, buddy. Yeah, we're, yeah. We're, um, we're getting some feedback on your mic. Yeah, we, I can't hear you now at all. Yeah, I, I couldn't hear. I couldn't hear a word he said. I couldn't hear him either. Okay, so so we'll, we'll go to Mike Stromey. Stromey, CJ Spiller. Yeah. That is hilarious. Go ahead, Mike, CJ Spiller. Okay, uh, CJ Spiller. Um, all right, well, now that he's essentially going to take the Pierre Thomas role in that offense as, uh, like, the main pass-catching running back. And if you look back to uh, the amount of targets uh, uh, Thomas has, he hasn't had more than – or he hasn't had less than 50 targets in a season since 2011. And in 2013, he had over 80. So – Go ahead, keep going. Honor, like, okay, yeah. So – you translate that, he's going to get a lot of receptions and a lot of yards. Plus, he's going to he's going to get the ball maybe 10, 12 times a game as well. So, maybe, maybe oh, the third round might. Am I here? Hey. <laughs> Am I here? Am I on the show? Yes. You're good. Line You're on the show. Line. Yep, we got okay. you. Got All you I was now. saying was it's very impressive that the guy's back seven days after a major surgery to remove an organ, and the incision point hasn't even healed yet, and he's playing sports. Now, my question is... How frequently does Matt Holliday get tackled around the waist and dragged to the ground? Oh, yeah, of course. I, I, I preface my entire point by saying the sports are totally um, it's different. All I'm saying is that right. I don't think you can blame an entire season on on that surgery is, is what my point was. Yeah. Maybe a week, maybe two. Yeah, no, then he came back and he tore his groin right after is what happened. So the poor guy. I mean, I've never torn my groin, but I would rather have my appendix out than tear my groin. I've been kicked in the groin, so I know what that feels like. Yeah. (laughs) Corey, we all know you don't have groins, so (laughs) stop pretending. Quiet, Jeff. Nobody asked you to speak, sir. Anyway, uh, uh, Stromey, hold on. Let Stromey finish his point when he was talking about Stromey when he brought Matt back in. Go ahead. Bottom line with Spiller is he's he's a running back with tons of speed. He can catch the ball. He's going to get a ton of targets, and he's going to get the ball like 10, 12 times a game. 
That's uh, there's there's a lot. He's gonna get a lot of action there, and there's there's significant value there. I don't know if I take him at the end of the third round. That might be a little high for somebody who's only on the field on passing downs, but uh, he's gonna have some success there. Yeah, um, um, Matt, did you want to kick in on the on the Spiller conversation? My my thing was Spiller. I, I agree on Spiller. I'm on board. I'm not gonna argue on Spiller. I love Spiller, and. The nice thing is, is when you when you do have a, a roster construction where you have a guy with with blazing speed last year Kenny Stills now this year Brandon Cooks stretching the field vertically but then you also have a Marcus Colston stretching the field horizontally that's what creates space mm-hmm. and CJ Spiller was essentially playing football in a closet so the offense was completely different in in, in Buffalo when he was there mm-hmm. I know they had Sammy Watkins for part of the season. He was there last year. But most of the time, he was in the anemic offense. When you thought of the anemic offense at the NFL, you thought of the Buffalo Bills. So he was both misused and misused within an overall offensive system that was devoid of other skill players other than him. Now he's going to the complete opposite situation, polar opposite situation, where now he has a great quarterback, there's other weapons occupying defenders, we are actually going to see, for the first time since Clemson, the real C.J. Spiller yes. will stand up, and I'm excited about it. Yep, yep, I'm 100% on board. Yeah. If well, I could on, add on, one on, quick Jeff. thing on, real on. quick. Hold on, Jeff. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I'm all on board with that. It's all about scheme. That's all this is all about. You, you take any player in the NFL with a great skill set, and you put him in a scheme that fits his skill set, he's going to be a pro bowler. But if you, you put him in a scheme that doesn't fit his skill set, if you got a guy that likes to run off the edges, and you, you want him to run you know, between the tackles, or you want him to run between the guard and the center and you know, as like a one-cut guy, which is not C.J. Spiller's game, then he's not going to be able to succeed long term. You put him in an offense, uh, you know, with Drew Brees and in New Orleans, you know they like to sling it. You know he's going to get screen passes. You know he's going to get the opportunity to touch the football. So I, I love Spiller this year. He, he's one of the guys that I'm targeting. That I'm hoping everybody is, is just on board with with Ingram because you know I, I think I could get him to round out my um, uh, my running back core at Major League Fantasy Football. So yeah, I'll be targeting him big time. Very happy with it. But I want to go to Jeff real quick though. Jeff tried to jump in. Uh, just a sec, Luke. <laughs> Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to just make – I think what helps with C.J. Spiller is that he doesn't have to be a north-south runner. And I think that's where a lot of his injuries come in because he's more of a, you know, put him out in the zone and see what happens yeah. type of um, running back. Mm-hmm. I think in Buffalo he had to be a north-south runner because of the type of offense they run, uh, where, you know, New England runs and Sean Payton, that type of offense is more of a spread them out, let's let's get the ball to our talent and make game plans and have plays packages together for C.J. Spiller. So I think his skill set um, is going to be great in New Orleans. No, absolutely. Yeah, well – it, it sucks to be the last guy to get to talk about Spiller because you guys have pretty much said, said everything I want to say. Um, but um, what I can add, and if you disagree, I'd like to hear it, but I would say the Saints and Drew Brees are probably one of, if not the best, screen teams and screen quarterbacks in the NFL. And as to go with what you guys were saying, what Corey was saying, with scheme, it's just a perfect fit for Spiller. I mean, who was his quarterback when he was in Buffalo? I can't even remember. That's true. <laughs> exactly. Um, I mean, he hasn't had one. Ryan Fitzpatrick? He hasn't had one. Yeah, exactly. Fitzpatrick, Manuel, Kyle Orton, who apparently is retired now. Um, and, I don't believe that. Um, <laughs> uh, so, you know, like, it, 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 I don't think he could have gone to a better place for his skill set. I really don't. Okay. Let's let's move on and talk about another. Uh, I think I think somewhat controversial. I mean, I, again, I listen to lots of different shows when I'm out and about, some stuff on Sirius Satellite Radio, and I try to peek in and listen as much as I can. And I hear conflicting um, conflicting feelings between different uh, people within the industry in regards to Sean McCoy this year. So um, I wanted to Jeff to get us started on Sean McCoy. This is a, a under. You listen again. You listen to him as under hype. Under hype. He is under hype. Under-hype. I don't know his. Draft status, and I just like when I listen to all these shows and all these podcasts, and people are like, "Stay away from Lashawn McCoy. He he's gonna be not what he was in Philadelphia. He's not in the Chip Kelly offense. Blah 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 blah." 
let's talk about his offensive coordinator and Greg Roman, who is not bad, who has history, who was uh, part of the pedigree with Bill Belichick. Uh, uh, Bill, uh, yeah, for the Ravens when they were there. He was part of their pedigree. What do they like to do? Do you remember a guy named Jeremy Lewis that used to get the ball all the time that developed a lot of screens in, bo- in uh, Jamal Baltimore? Lewis? Jamal Lewis? Uh, Jamal Lewis, yeah, yeah. And then you also got, you know, Frank Gore out in San Francisco and how he developed. Yes, Frank Gore is more of a north-south runner, but, you know, he had packages together to get guys out there and get the ball. I think Greg Roman is going to make LeSean McCoy that running back to make him a top 10 fantasy this year. I think really that offense besides Sammy Watkins or Watkins um, has really nothing else there. And I see just being LaShawn McCoy and Sammy Watkins, uh, Watkins, if I'm pronouncing his last name, forgive me, but it's going to be the guy that really sits back and I think can help with that pecking order of how many points can you get and spreading the ball out. I think LaShawn McCoy is very underrated this year and could be a top 10 pick depending on where you get him. Okay, let's let's, let's go to Matt. Buffalo. <laughs> One word, that's it. All right, let's move on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is that all you got? <laughs> that's all at Buffalo. Yeah, I don't draft... I don't use you know, top three round draft capital on skill position players on bottom five offenses. So I just copy and paste my analysis from TJ Yeldon, from even Arian Foster. I love oh, an Arian Foster guy because he his quarterback is the worst quarterback in the league, Brian Hoyer. So no, I'm not drafting. Similar similar re- reasoning. It's I, I wish it was more complicated. I wish I had some advanced metrics for you, but I don't. No, you don't. You don't need it. You don't, you don't need it, and that's that's what we preach a lot. Is that in this in this circumstance, what you're doing with advanced metrics is just trying to back up what you think you see with your eyes and what you understand with, uh, about the game, or maybe find some value rooted in there somewhere. But at the end of the day, yeah, I mean, if you know, if you take that type of a common sense approach, I don't want anything to do with a team with a bad offense and the running game. I mean, you can't really argue too much with that. To be honest with you, uh, Lou, what do you got on on uh, McCoy? Okay, well, I mean, the, I highly, highly, highly doubt that LaShawn McCoy is going to have the 2013 season he had with over 2,000 all-purpose yards and all that. But if LaShawn McCoy puts up even what he did last year, um, I mean, I say he's still easily a top three or four round running back. I don't think he's underhyped or overhyped, though. I think he's, again... I'm going to go back to the evenly height. Evenly um, I think people know the type of player he is. Um, I agree wholeheartedly with Matt that going to Buffalo is not necessarily ideal. But at the same time, I mean, who is his competition there at all? Like, what, what's his competition there? Fred Jackson. Can, can anyone Fred, tell me? Fred Jackson. Uh, yeah, Fred well, Jackson, Bryce Brown, and... Yeah, yep. a rookie. Yeah, exactly. Another Bryce Brown, another guy they went after and could help out. Yeah, I mean, I played Booby Dixon, too. Oh, Booby Dixon. Booby Dixon. <laughs> <laughs> Look, listen, I like Booby as much as Anthony the next now? guy. But I like Boobies as much as the next guy. But either way, um, I think McCoy is – Exactly where he should be. I wouldn't. I wouldn't go crazy on him because he is in Buffalo. But the guy's got a skill set. The guy's a very smart runner. The Bills are continuing to slowly improve every year. So I, I would give this guy the benefit of, of the doubt. And um, if people are going to not take him and he's available in the fifth or sixth round for some reason, I would jump on him in a second. Yeah. Well, yeah, if he, if he falls, I mean, at, 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 some, at some point, you know, the opportunity, you want the guys to get opportunity, and he's gonna, he should have plenty of opportunity in Buffalo. I do yeah. think Buffalo is going to be a much, much better football team this year, especially with bringing in yeah. uh, Rex Ryan and then, you know, getting that. They already had a good defense, but bringing him in to quarterback that defense mm-hmm. is going to ratchet up that team to the next level. I think they're going to be very competitive this year. Their problem right now is at quarterback. You know, that, that is a big problem. And I think Rex Ryan's all pretty much... And guess what? But he's never really had a quarterback. And Greg... 
No, and you're very right. And I think EJ Manuel is the kind of the sleeping horse right now. And everybody's down what he's done. And I know in the camp, I think I had last read that he was like third on the depth chart or something like that. But it's just like, hey, Greg Roman took Colin Kaepernick and made him look like somewhat of a quarterback. Couldn't he do the same with EJ Manuel? It's possible. And no. look at the Bills. Look at the Bills' defensive fronts. Mario Williams, Marcel Darius, and Kyle Williams. Those guys are huge. They have a great defense. And now they got Rex Ryan in there. I well, mean, here's, here's they, how you, they're, they're going to be good. Here's how you need to look at that. Because they're going to be a lot better. What, what, we, what we haven't talked about much on the show, which we normally talk about a good deal, is defense. We usually dr- drill into the defensive side of the game because it's going to tell you something as well on the offensive side of the ball. I think def- uh, um, Buffalo's defense is so damn good, and, they, and I think their offense is going to be a ball control offense. So we know opportunities, uh, abundance, uh, are going to be there for LaShawn McCoy in regards to touches and getting his hands on the football, being, being All like on the ball. What was that, Jeff? And they master they master defense as a three four, mm-hmm. but in reality they're really a four three because Mary Rams is going to be on the weak side of that off, uh, defensive line, yep. and he is going to be containing those tight ends. He's going to be containing that tackle on the outside, and that and uh, the, the linebacker opportunity. There's a number of linebackers there, and their names are not on the top of my head right now. But we talked about it two weeks ago, a week ago, yeah, and it was though, just. Right? There's, you think about what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, the defense is just going to be The defense is going, is, going to keep, is going to keep – allow the offense to stay on the field. The defense is going to be the best part of that of that team, period. The defense is going to be the best Preston part. Preston Brown, Jeff. And, and they're going to want uh, to – yeah. Preston, Preston Brown. Preston Brown, yes. Thank you, Lord. Preston Brown and IDP, really quick, when we're on I, – um, really on um, offenses right, right now, but Preston Brown is a guy that I would grab up this year. And I'm telling you, do you remember the Baltimore Ravens when they had Trent Dilfer as their quarterback? <laughs> and no offense, really. Then that defense taking them all the way to the Super Bowl. Like, Buffalo could be that type of guy. Cause that, Shame the with the Bucs with Brad Johnson. It's amazing. Shame I mean, with the Bucs with Brad Johnson. No, that, even on the Tampa 2 defense is a little bit different. Nice, but, like, it's... Yeah, but yes, I give you that. Yes, I could. Yeah. I could see that. But I see it more likely and possible sitting there in Buffalo because of that defense. And I know Matt looks like his head yeah. is about to explode. Yeah. <laughs> but like getting the IDP conversations, Matt. I'm telling you, bro. Preston Wilson. Buffalo? I mean, Preston Brown is, uh, is going to be Super Bowl contender. Good. Is this is this happening? I, I, I would say. I that. would say Super Bowl contender. I was looking around, would you I say wanted, that. I didn't know the sky was falling. I wanted to make sure that I was in the right dimension of the universe. I didn't know if I. Was so we gotta a say things like this. Matt, like, let me explain what happens on the show. <laughs> Like, Matt, what happens on the show, we say a lot of crazy things like Corey said last year about Monty Ball, so we can get it right once in a while. So that's why we got it, okay? Speaking of outside the universe, I saw a documentary last night about UFOs and how there's a whole government uh, conspiracy. Stop, stop. Okay, um, all right. On, on whole football. government conspiracy behind this, so. Oh, we, we have totally you know, degenerated. Who's Max? Can we get into the Matt, rookies? Yeah, let's, 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 Matt let's, might be on the rookies something. right now. Yes. Luke yes. Let's, let's is go in on, California. On. Do we need to say anything else? He's so, in California. We, we, we don't know. need to slow, say anything else. He's got down there. Slow down, guys. We're, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna move the conversation to Jeff. one. Jeff, we, I have a quick question for you. <clears throat> I need to ask Jeff a question. Go ahead. Jeff, give me a couple wide receivers that you like under the radar. Ooh. Ah, you put me on a spot there. Under the radar. Cole Beasley. Cole. Uh, well, definitely Cole Beasley. I can see that. Okay, Cole Beasley. Uh, There's one. One more. One more. One more. Nelson uh, from uh, Philadelphia. Nelson. Uh, Nelson Alec, Aguilar. Whatever it is. Yep, sure. he's number two as a rookie. I know he's a rookie, but I think he can fit well into that offense. Um, I think everybody's more under the radar. Ruben, more under the radar. Just a little under the Ruben radar. Ruben Randall. Ruben Randall. No, I don't. Okay. How about Victor Cruz? Victor Cruz. Nobody's talking about Victor Cruz. You yeah, want to talk about the radar? More talk about Jeffrey, one more, just one more, a little more under the radar. I, I I don't know how deep under the radar you want to get, man. Let's see. Uh, Jeffrey, just the huh? next level down from Cruz. The very bottom. 
I no, mean, I would go Martavius Bryant. Bryant. No, Bryant. 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 Okay, that's what I'm yes. talking about. Okay, so I just want to recap. If Jeff were running an NFL franchise, his starting lineup skill positions would be Monte Ball at running back, E.J. Yes. Manuel yep. at wide receiver, and Cole Beasley and Mark Davis Bryant at wide receiver. Yep. And, and guess what? And I would have the best defense in the world. Nobody would touch my defense, okay? You give me J.J. Wall, Vincent Wolford, you give me Greg Harden, and we can put a defense together that can stop all these gimmicks with these offense guys. Guess what? Yeah. It's going to get in the next yard on offense. It's too defense easy with Aaron Rodgers, Jeff. You need to go oh, to with E.J. Manuel. Yes. I, I was, it is too easy. You're right. Give me more of a challenge. You need to have a, a wardrobe I, on your back. I, You're so gonna, this is how you, if you were a kung fu, you wouldn't even use your other arm. Exactly, because that's how talented my defense would be. That's right. So Jeff, defense Jeff, wins championships. Defense Jeff, wins yeah, championships. Say, Remember Jeff, that. Are you, are you, are you, Jeff? Are you suggesting that pretty much what you're saying is that defense wins championships the way that pit, pitching beats good hitting? Good yes. Pitch. Yeah, yep. I mean, that's, so that's, that's why I'm a Cowboys good. fan so, and a Mets fan. Okay. Well, Manuel drops through. back, fakes the handoff to Ball. Oh, goes deep to Cole Beasley. Touchdown. <laughs> oh, Jeff <laughs> Seed wins the Super Bowl. Yes. And guess what? This was opposite world. world. Oh. Hey, hey, oh. hey, 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 the 2001 Baltimore Yo, Ravens that Jeff, did that? Jeff, Didn't the Jeff, Baltimore Ravens prove Jeff, that already? Listen, listen, Jeff, Jeff, yes. everybody, let's get back on track. Rookies. Rookies, <laughs> you guys are like gone. We haven't got a chance to really touch on many rookies. We did touch, we did touch Buck Allen, but let's talk about a few rookies. Let's talk about a few of the rookies because we'll, we'll be wrapping the show up here in about 15 minutes. So, um, Matt, go ahead and get us started on, on uh, Tevin Coleman from Atlanta. Tevin Coleman, he just, I, I just saw a tweet. I have a breaking news. We're going to run a breaking news sound. Bim, 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 bim. We have some breaking news from the Atlanta Falcons. Tevin Coleman was quoted saying that he believes he will be the starting running back to start the season, which is, of course, where they all think that they're going to be the starting running back, of course. But to say it publicly to a reporter in the locker room with Devonta Freeman sitting next to you, I love it. Definitely ballsy. Ballsy for sure. Jeff, what do, you, what do you got there? Defense wins championships. Yeah, Kevin Coleman is one of <laughs> Kevin Coleman is one of like five running backs in the history of the NFL to to have a sub four five forty and rush for over two thousand yards. So if you just look at those two metrics, Tevin Coleman is one of the most precocious running backs to come out of college ever, and yet. He was a third-round pick because he doesn't, again, look the part of the every-down workhorse. If Tevin Coleman looked like C.J. Anderson, he would have been a first-round pick. But because he looks more like a wide receiver, he was a third-round pick. That doesn't change the fact that Tevin Coleman is awesome, and he's in a high-volume offense, which is what I really like in Atlanta. And and he's getting the first-team reps. No, that's that's, that's, – Yeah, this guy. This Tevin Coleman. Get ready. Matt, Matt. Get ready. He's a home-run hitter. What are we thinking? Tevin Coleman, Devontae Freeman, are they going to be splitting carries? Do you think they're, they're both would probably be involved in the offense, I would think. I, I would highly doubt that they would just come out and say, well, this guy's going to be a bell cow, and Devontae Freeman's just going to sit on the bench. I have a hard time believing that. No, it's not going to be a bell cow situation. Last year, Devontae Freeman had close to an 80% catch rate. Devontae Freeman's actually pretty special in the mm-hmm. pass game. He just, between the tackles, he's useless. So on first and second down, it will be Tevin Coleman in the red zone. It will be Tevin Coleman on third down and in passing situations. It will be Devonta Freeman. So I like both of them. And in a, in a, on a team with that's high volume, a team that's passing all the time, a team that's throwing up a lot of points, you can sustain two fantasy-relevant running backs. You know, and, and just to point this out. In, can we say this? Also, okay. Jeff, hold on, hold on, don't, hold on, don't interrupt. In, in our leagues, just so you understand, this type of a situation where you, you go into the season, you have two running backs that we, we're not 100% certain. Maybe one guy gets 15 touches, the other guy gets 12 or 8 and 10 or whatever that's set up. The way our league's structured, you can, you can actually attack 
that type of a backfield and you can deploy both of the players to, you know, to obviously make sure that, that you get whatever comes out of that backfield. Obviously, you could do a lot of other things to strategize that way, too. But this might be an opportunity or might be one area, at least for people to play in early, that you might want to consider. Jeff, go ahead. Jeff. This is what I got to say about your man, Jeff. I, I, I love him. I, I He's an Indiana guy. You know what I mean? Big Ten all the way. Um, but oh, this is a practice before you trash the guy. Okay. <laughs> all right. Nothing but respect Co- for him, but... Yes. <laughs> but the college stat. Let's go in his fresh, like, 2012, where he only got the game. He was in the game 12 times, had 51 carry, 225 yards for the season. Well, let's go to his junior year. Oh, wait, hold on. Yeah, he played in nine games, got 131, and barely, not even close to 1,000 yards. So he was at 958. Oh, let's go to the one good year he had in Indiana and say, oh, he got 270 attempts, almost double his attempts, and he ran over 2,000 yards. And let's crown him as the best running back for the rookie class this year. I, I mean, no, I think Freeman, three. And I, I can see. Number three rookie. Okay. Well, I mean, yeah, I just look at it back. like this. Freeman has a year in the NFL. Um, Devontae Freeman could do it. He could be that special guy. They're going to be splitting carries. I don't think he, Coleman's going to run away with his job. I think Atlanta has went out. They got a great offense. They improved their offensive line, which is going to help out the running game towards the end of the year because they went heavy in the offensive line this year. And I think Freeman – and Coleman are going to be a one-two punch. I don't see either one of them run away with the job. Okay. I think Coleman will literally run away from the job, with the job. He will literally I run away the job with the opposite direction. 80-yard run in preseason, <laughs> South. and he will be the early yeah, down guy. South. Let's, let's get Mike involved, South, guys. I want to get, I want to get Mike involved in the conversation either. here. Yeah. I want to get Mike involved. Mike, ahead, Mike, Mike here. Mike, what do you got to say? Mike, oh, Mike, what do you got to say? What I got to say is – don't forget that um, they did, they had a change in offensive coordinator. They got Kyle Shanahan there, and with the Cleveland Browns last year, they ran about over sixty percent of the time in the red zone, which could mean that he's gonna like, that offense is gonna be there quite a bit. And Coleman's obviously gonna be the guy who's gonna get the goal line carries. So whether you know owning a, an Atlanta running back is gonna prove to be fruitful, and you know Coleman looks to be the top guy there. I mean, Freeman is going to be the, the change of pace guy, but and the guy you you throw the sweep past or the you know the check down to, but well, the, in, in, in the red zone, it's going to be Coleman, and he I wouldn't be surprised if he put up double digit touchdowns. Lou, real quick, I, I want to I want to rapid fire a couple more. It's a value real conversation, fast. right? These guys are going in the sixth round or later, but they're, they're yeah, playing but Atlanta, so that's why you have to love the what? situation, okay. the high volume situation so, where the running backs look, are going guys, later guys, in the draft. Guys, that's what you guys. want, as opposed to just before set the second round. Real quick question. Okay, real quick question for everybody then. So, where is Coleman being drafted at? Out of curiosity, does anybody know off the top of their head so we don't waste too much time and Corey yells at us? Because, you know, and the matter he gets, the redder his head gets. In the sixth <laughs> round. In the sixth round, well, who we talked about earlier today, right? In the sixth round, would you take LaShawn McCoy before Coleman? Well, of course. Well, I'm Coleman, Coleman is I'm... going right after – Coleman is going right after Amir Abdullah, Giovanni Bernard – and uh, wow. T.J. Yeldon and Latavius Murray. That's the zone so, where you're drafting wow. Kevin okay. Coleman. I would so, take Coleman uh, before so, all those guys. I would take Bernard before all those guys. How do you not – everybody's like – and that's why Bernard should have been on this list as an under guy because Bernard is going to be a big factor this year. Like, are you kidding me? You're going to take a guy that's his first year that does have legit competition in Atlanta – Nobody knows Kyle Shanahan, great what he does. His father, Mike Shanahan, is one of the best head coaches, I think, besides all the plastic surgery he does on his life. But everything other than that, he's like one of the great coaches in the NFL who modernized the offense into what it is today. Great set of tools. But I'm telling you, Kyle Shanahan is going to be the type of coordinator that's going to get both those guys out there. And I see maybe a... Hey, Jeff, Jeff, 55, Jeff, while you're talking, 45 reps. Do me a favor, Jeff. While you're talking, transition directly into Melvin Gordon. Right into Melvin Gordon. Because I want I want us to talk about a couple more rookies real quick. We don't have much time left. So, Melvin right, Gordon. So, what I would say, I would take uh, Bernard over him. And then Melvin Gordon is a guy that I would take over Coleman, by the way. And mm-hmm. the reason why I would take him over Coleman is because, look, guys, he sat there. He I, Look. 
this guy looks like a NFL running back. I mean, if you just go on his the, his highlight films in college and what he did for those years out in college and how he protects the ball, he knows how to get between the tackles, and he knows how to put his head down and run people over when they come to tackling him. He is the prototypical type running back. And San Diego, who's going to challenge him? I mean, who? Who's going to really challenge him? Is San Diego? Oliver, nobody. I, yeah, nobody's going to challenge him unless Zach Stacy ends up there because the Jets cut him, like we talked about earlier in the podcast. But we'll move on from that. But uh, Gordon, I think he got good hands. He, you, he's an all-down back. He, this guy is worth drafting high, and this is why I say, think about it. If you're in a dynasty league, what other rookie running backs right now on a team has nobody else that's like really can cut into their time, their load, their workload. I mean, I can't name anyone else really, right? I mean, is there Only really TJ one other guy? There was a, right. TJ Yeldon and maybe yeah. Derek John, Duke Johnson, right? Duke Johnson, maybe. But I mean, I think, but uh, with, what about the caliber of team that you have? What about the caliber of team? Like sure. you got TJ Yelt going to Jacksonville, where you got Melvin Gordon going to see, um, San Diego, who has Philip Rivers, an established quarterback. T- uh, you got Gates there. You got all they got yeah, a de- great, de- average, if not be up above average offensive line and a good defense. He's going into yeah, an ideal situation, line, and Actually, I think Gordon is going to be going. <laughs> Yeah. He's the best. No, this, I think this rookie was, other running back this, this year. This, this was a great pick by you because they they actually have a, a actually fantastic offensive line. So it, Melvin Gordon definitely. Yeah. I mean, if if you're really if you're really digging into like especially in a dynasty league and you're you guys are drafting, I mean Melvin Gordon would be the first running back that I'm touching. I mean at least the rookies that would be the first one that I would take. I mean I think the running and, and, and Corey, just to add one more thing. Just so, you know, Matt sees this. I mean, we, we understand everything else. Before, right? Can you keep that up for the rest of the show, Jeff? <laughs> if someone's tuning in late, we want to make sure they get the message. Just hold that up for the rest of the show. I get you. I got it. Go, go ahead, uh, uh, Matt. Talk to us about Melvin Gordon real quick, and then we'll go to Lou and Mike after that. What about Mike? Mike, is Mike here? Mike, what do you have to say about this? I want to hear your I'm opinion. Trying, trying to get a word in headphones with these guys, and <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. That, no, I'm, I'm think, here trying uh, to keep the peace. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah. Mike, get in there. Talk yeah. over him, Mike. Talk like I just did. See what I just did there? Talk over That's him. That's just the Canadian in me. I'm polite. I want to let these guys go do their thing. Don't and, be know, polite. Sorry. Talk over me. I'm talking right now. Talk over me right now. No, go, Mike. Go ahead. Talk, <laughs> talk over me right now. Start talking. Like Start talking. Start talking. Start <laughs> talking. Get out, Mike. <laughs> He's in almost a perfect situation. He's got nobody around him. He's got a great offensive line, and he's got an offense that's not going to have defenses stacking the box on him. He's going to see some good looks, and he's he's uber talented. If it weren't for uh, Gurley's knee problems, I'd he might challenge All right, me, Mike. You, okay, you're done. All right, I'm, 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 I'm in. I'm in. Okay, so I was in a dynasty league that has an auction value with rookie drafts, and I spent 150 out of my $200 budget for all rookies, all on Melvin Gordon. Because, yes, I agree with Jeff, Melvin Gordon landed in the best spot. I actually uh, just launched a brand-new podcast in conjunction with Football Diehards. I'm doing the Football Diehards podcast now. In our first episode, we did winners and losers from the offseason. And the number one winner on draft day in terms of the situation that he parachuted into was Melvin Gordon. So I agree with all of you. Melvin Gordon is a lock for over a 1,000 yards and will approach, if not exceed, 10 touchdowns this year. And you have to think that, that he will be the most productive rookie running back of this class. Yep, absolutely. There's, I, don't think, I don't think there's any doubt about it. Lou, did you want to throw something in real quick? No, Matt just kind of did everything for me. So we we should bring him back more often. We should bring him back more often because he he, he, yes. he makes my my life a lot easier. Yeah, Lou, you should really just lay off the miracle marijuana right now, dude. You're too slow to respond today. Yo, peace, dude. Maybe it's in the brownies. So let's let's talk about one more guy. Let's talk about one more guy, and then we'll wrap the show up. Um, TJ, let's talk about TJ Yeldon actually. Um, to get us started, uh, let's Mike get us started. TJ Yeldon. 
TJ Yeldon. Well, he's going to, again, kind of like Gordon. He's like Gordon, except the offense around him is, you know, Stay. I'm not even going to get into it. <laughs> but he has no other click. He's going to be the three-down guy there, which, you know, has some value. Um, but then Something. again, I said that about, uh, what's his name? Uh, the name is Kobe me. Gerhardt. He was Peter Gerhardt, yeah. He was like this. They, they overdrafted him, and he didn't really produce. So, I mean, there's, there's value in a guy who has the job and will get a high volume of carries, but, you know, I'd like to see what he does with that before I get too involved in him. Okay. Let's let's go to Lou this time. Lou's been well, quiet for a little while. I'd like to – okay, well, what I would like to say first is that do you guys know what college T.J. Yeldon came from? <laughs> Alabama. What happens when Alabama players come to the NFL? They are awesome because that <laughs> is how that system works. They prepare players for the NFL. I don't care if Jacksonville is not good. He will make them better. He is the answer for them at running back. I've been actually reading a lot of reports about him, and he is far, far beyond his years when it comes to preparation and intelligence to understanding the playbook. And he has been in meetings with all the quarterbacks and is actually making suggestions to them on plays, and they're loving it. They love this guy. He's a perfect fit there. And, again, Alabama. That's okay. all I got to say. Jeff. You're right. I mean, so the, you, you, Trent Richardson proves your point. All you have to look is so exactly. Right. <laughs> I, you beat me to the punch, man. That's not fair. You beat me to the punch. Was Trent Richardson pretty good in his rookie year, I thought? Well, wasn't he? I'm pretty sure that was one of his better years. 3.9 yards per carry. He wasn't very good. Yeah. All right. So uh, let's, 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 the Browns you know, weren't that good. Uh, okay. But, Matt, let's, let's give him one thing. He is right because you got, you know, Mark Ingram, who took six years to get it going and be that running back that he is now. You got Eddie Lacy that took three years to get it going and no, be that great back. No, we didn't take Eddie Lacy those so three years. I agree with what are you Lou. talking about? What are you talking I, about? You're not three years Eddie Lacy going years. on fantasy huh? relevant. Let's go. But let me tell you this, okay? <laughs> I will give TJ. Um, also, Mark Ingram, years. Mark Ingram had three other running backs there. Yelled oh. okay. at nobody. Can I, can I get a star? Look, no. look, medical okay. water is making you Eddie very angry guy. Medical Eddie marijuana Lacey is making you a very angry guy. a person. superstar. Listen, sir. And the number one I'm receiver team. on the Seattle Seahawks, is it Kevin Norwood? <laughs> no. It is. <laughs> it's Kevin Norwood. <laughs> oh, and but it's it's Jimmy Graham. Alabama. I know. Jimmy Graham. But he was the number okay. one re- re- receiver on Alabama a couple of years ago. Kevin yeah, Norwood is amazing, point. right? Yeah. And, I, and the whole thing is this. TJ is going to be – in the situation here, Jacksonville is getting better. They got a good quarterback. He's growing with them, but he's two to three years away. Alabama running backs and products don't make an immediate impact, except for, like, guys like Julio Jones. Uh, yeah, he went to Alabama. He was really good, but he was on a different level. I just see TJ, I think their offense is still being put together. I think there's still a few offensive linemen away. There's still a receiver away. I don't. I think the biggest bust is going to be that tight end they went after and paid all that money to, the biggest bust of the year this year. Um, but that quarterback is mature. And the great thing about Brady uh, Burrell is he's progressing year after year, game after game. But TJ Yates, I, I think they're too far away with the offense. The line that he's going to be irrelevant this year. Solved. Matt, go ahead. TJ Yates will absolutely be irrelevant this year. <laughs> yes, yeah, I agree. He <laughs> definitely will be. Irrelevant. Yeah. I would have I'm to not agree drafting TJ Yates, even if he's in the last Neither round of the fantasy draft, based on what yep. Jeff just said. Thank you. Yeah. That's great Jeff, support. Jeff, Thanks, Jeff, Jeff has no idea. Hold on, hold and Jeff on. has no idea that we're making fun of him. No, he has no yes, idea. Yes, I do. Jeff, I, do. He said, I just realized I botched the world. I just realized I botched the world. Yeah, you botched the word up, but then you didn't. You didn't. You weren't listening to what they were saying. You just kept like, okay. <laughs> There's nothing I can do about it because I can't correct it. It's too late. It's on this damn way. It's over. Corey, yeah. Corey, can you do your Jeff impression one more time for us? <laughs> I don't know if I can remember how to do it. It's it's it's. Oh, I 
Dude, go, go. It was, dude, it was good. Do it again. Do it again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's a go to new go to move for Corey right there. Uh, look, <laughs> let's you know let's go ahead and uh, let, let's wrap the show up, guys, because I, I know we all have to get to the rest of our Saturdays. And I wanted to to let everybody know to tune in to our um, our show to our night on Sports Blues Radio uh, for our, our baseball show. It starts from seven o'clock and runs until nine o'clock. You can obviously find that on our website. You can just go to sport, uh, Sports Palooza. Uh, radio on Blog Talk Radio will find us there. Lou Landers will be a guest. Joe Sacconi, our chief editor, will also be a guest. Uh, Joe Iannone, uh, who's been with us for years as well, will also be a guest on the show. We're going to be talking about straight up and down, like all the trades and how it affects your fantasy teams. So we have a lot. We actually have a lot to discuss tomorrow. And I also want to thank our partners at White River Graphics uh, for providing uh, the backdrops, hats, and everything for us. Our partner at Real Deal Dynasty Sports, Mr. Brian Lures. Uh, Lisa Inucci and EJ Gar from uh, Sports Blues Radio. So, and also next week, next week we will have a show. And I, if I remember correctly, Zach's on the show. The Zach Sauer, who's been focusing on wide receivers. So me and Lou and Jeff and Zach will be back next week. It'll be just four of us. And um, you know, tune in for that. We'll have it posted on our um, on our uh, YouTube uh, page by four o'clock Eastern uh, time. So. Before we wrap up, I wanted to go to each and every one of you guys if you wanted to do a quick closing statement or argument. And then obviously, Matt, you know, please, please educate the audience again on where they can find you and et cetera, et cetera. So we'll, we'll, um, we'll go to Matt first. Matt, um, again, thanks for coming on, man. I really do appreciate it. Um, it was a lot of fun. You're, def- you're definitely an animated guy. Uh, very interesting. So, uh, but yeah, again, uh, uh, thanks for coming on. Well, you told me there was a camera. Too. What'd you say? <laughs> You told me this was a camera. This was a podcast with a camera. So I was trying to be animated. There you go. I was trying to do stuff with my hands and stuff. Absolutely. This is a camera, right? You guys can see me? Good. <laughs> Thank goodness. I thought I was just doing that the whole time for my own amusement. That's good. Okay, well. Well, you were. Hope you enjoyed you my were. appearance on this podcast, everybody. If you want more of me, you can find me on iTunes, Stitcher, what have you, Roto Underworld Radio, or Football Diehards podcast. Those are those are my podcasts. And if you'd like to have the, the, the easiest access to advanced football metrics on players, you can go to just the metrics that help predict performance. Go to www.playerprofiler.com and you can type in a player and see if he's good or not. Also follow me on Twitter at fantasy underscore mansion. That's that's awesome. And, and you know, obviously when we get our, our live radio shows going during the season. You know, we'll invite you to come on with, uh, to those as well. I'm sure you'll have a lot of fun with them. Uh, we take callers and stuff, so I'm sure you'll enjoy that. Uh, yeah, but anyway, thanks again, Matt. We really appreciate it. Thanks again. And uh, let's go over to Jeff, or excuse me, to Mike, our, our, our other guest, one of our writers. Uh, you can find his stuff uh, it's published every Monday. He's focusing on the running back position. So I wanted to thank Mike for coming on. If you had a quick closing statement or something you wanted to say, please do so, Mike. Uh, don't really have much to say. Follow me on Twitter at, at Mike or at Stro- Sorry, at, <laughs> at Stromi93, S-T-R-O-M-M-E. Uh, every Monday on MajorLeagueFantasySports.com. Stro me the way. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, 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 oh. Of, Stro of me the way. Yeah, Love it. Of, of course. I want to thank I want to thank um, Jeff good. Nelson as well for coming on. Uh, Jeff, did you have a quick quick uh, quick couple things you want to say before we wrap up? I just hope we bring Matt back again and Mike back again because I love the hats and the, the incredible contortions and looks like we might have a seizure type epileptic something going on over there. I don't know what's going on over there with Matt, but you know it was very good. Were you trying yeah. to say epileptic, champ? No, I wasn't. I was gonna say seizure, something, but you know sometimes that's where it slip my mind sometimes, but. I think this was probably one of the funniest shows I've had in a long time. Yeah, oh, I did say TJ Yates too, didn't I? Oh, no, you didn't. But I tell you now. what, this but, no, was, but you, yeah. you also said Monte Ball on purpose. <laughs> yes, I did. I did. I did. But the problem is, is that this was probably one of the best shows, fellas, and I enjoy coming on here. And I really hope Corey really gets y'all back, as, even as early as next week, because it was a blast this week. I'm tired of hearing Corey's voice and Lou's yeah, voice. Only. I like that. <laughs> yeah, it was huge. So, so thank you, Lou, thank your you, arms stink, dude. Go thanks, save your armpits, bro. Thanks. Thank you again, Jeff, for coming on the show and all, all of your funny little quips and, like, messing up every word. I appreciate that very much. 
Lou, Lou Landers. Uh, That's what again, the, your unique character. Thanks again, thanks again for coming on and being a part of the shows and doing what you do. And uh, you know, if you had a couple quick things you want to say real fast, we'll get it out. We'll go ahead and get out of here. Yeah, I was just gonna say, don't draft TJ Yates. The word, <laughs> the word, the word is epileptic. And <sighs> last but not least, I stand by my thoughts on Yeldon, not Yates, Yeldon on Jacksonville, <laughs> and I think he's going to be great. Uh, right. okay, hey, guess what? Okay, Go Mets. Sure. Go oh, Mets. You can draft. Thank you, thank you very much for everybody for listening and joining us today. We will be back next week. Thanks again.